Hey, everybody. Welcome back to The Secret to Everything. I'm so happy for you to drop in. I am going to continue playing, uh, like I said, uh, this interview um, by Terry Lovelace, who spoke to a small private group of mine. So I'm going to continue playing that for you. I do want to point out that through 10 years of running thousands of people through the technology and looking at the frequencies in their field, that everybody is being taken. Now, is everybody being bodily taken? Most people are, yes. Uh, your pets are being taken. Um, clones are being taken. Empty vessels are being taken. Um, everyone's being taken. Um, how often are they being taken? By who they're being taken? That's a whole nother conversation that eventually we'll get into. Uh, but we have found that everyone is being taken. So whether you remember it or not, as lucidly as Terry, you're being taken. So I also want to take the time and invite you into my membership group, my monthly membership group, with it, where I share confidential information that is given to me by people that I know, um, people in my life uh, that work in the matrix. And I call that like a first level 3D type of information. And then I share off planet information as well. So um, yeah, please join our groups if you're interested in the things that I talk about and I teach. And I'll see you on the other side of this interview. I hope you enjoy um, this part as well. And I didn't understand that. So I went to the hospital. They, I mean, I've had enough uh, cardiac history. I mean, I know the drill. You know, they're going to do chest X-ray, EKG, and cardiac enzymes. Uh, so they did those and they came back and said, you know, cardiologists came back and said, you know, everything looks fine. You know, no changes since your last EKG. He says, I don't know what happened to you, but uh, we're going to kick you out of here and uh, go home. I'm like, cool, great. I'm ready. So they sent me home and I went home that evening, had dinner. And like I normally do after dinner, I told my wife, I'm going to go for my walk. Cause after, after dinner, every night, I like to walk a mile and a half and two miles, maybe, um, and even though I'd had this weird experience during the day, I felt well enough to go for my walk. So I, I get to the uh, sidewalk and I click on my health app from the iPhones, iPhones health app. And uh, I look at it and, you know, it says the number of steps walked. Well, it was like 304 or something because I'd been in the hospital all day. But below it, it had stairs climbed. And it said six flights that I, that I had climbed six flights of stairs that day. And I look at it and the time on the XY graph is like 5.23 AM. Well, I didn't get up till 5.55. So, um, and there was, I mean, I live in a Texas, lived, I sold that house, but I lived in a Texas ranch with uh, you know, a four inch stoop at the front door and that's it, there were no steps. So this is, I don't know how well you can see that or if you can see that, um, but it says six flights for stairs. Uh, flights climbed six floors, uh, 416, uh, 524 AM. And then the second graph shows a spike uh, straight up. So normally I, I can't climb six flights of stairs in less than a minute, you know? Uh, so like if I go to a parking garage or something and I have to walk a flight of stairs to get up back up to the parking garage, I'll have a stair step type arrangement because as the graph is moving from left to right, it's the passage of time. And the, the vertical, uh, vertical line shows the height in 10 foot increments. And I would normally have a stair the stair step like readout as I would walk up, time passes, I reach the first floor. Uh, but this is a single bar. So I took my phone, cause I'm, I got, this has to be something wrong with the phone, right? Took my phone to uh, the Apple store and gave it to a woman who said she was an engineer and that she would check it out for me. And I came back and she said, there's nothing wrong with your phone. There's nothing wrong with the app. And I said, well, uh, cause I was curious. I said, how, how is the height measured? How, how does the phone know that I climbed six flights of stairs? And she said it measures, uh, and this was a surprise to me. I thought it was GPS or something, but it's not. It measures change in barometric pressure. And I'm like, well, you know, 
barometric pressure varies all the time. How, is that accurate? And she's like, oh yeah, it's very accurate. Accurate within six minutes. I mean, pardon me, within six inches. So um, this readout means that, what it means is that this phone was 60 feet over my home between 523 and 524 AM. So, and that phone was in my pocket of my shirt, which was attached to me. And uh, so something happened to me. I don't know what, but you know, I, I think that uh, I think that I had an experience that night. I think they came and uh, and took me. So, you know, do I have firm evidence? I got evidence that my phone went up sixty feet, um, but I, I can't for certain say any, draw any more conclusions than that. Um, but I put that in the second book, and I had people email me and say same thing happened with my Fitbit. I had a lot of maybe six people that. Uh, had the same experience where they woke up in one morning and either felt fine or did, you know, didn't feel quite right. And when they look at their Fitbit, they find that, uh, you know, they had climbed six flights of stairs or 10 flights of stairs or, or something similar. And, um, you know, maybe in the middle of the night. So um, is that evidence of an abduction? Um, Maybe anecdotally, yeah, it's not certainly not empirical evidence, but uh, I, I think it's worth consideration. So, and I'm completely off topic and I was answering your question about why I have uh, such good recall. And um, I should mention one, well, one thing I wanted to mention was that when I had these experiences in 1977, I, uh, I kept a journal, uh, just loose leaf paper. I kept a journal, but I kept a pretty detailed journal uh, because I was concerned that uh, they were gonna uh, court martial us. Uh, I mean, we were guilty of trespassing into on the federal property. I mean, I didn't see that as a crime of the century, uh, but these guys scared me. They, these OSI people scared, scared me to death. And I wanted to have my story preserved. So I kept a very detailed journal of everything that happened to us from the day after the event uh, up through about 1980 uh, when I was out of the Air Force and out of danger in my mind. So I had that journal uh, stored away in a storage locker uh, to rely on. Uh, so that's why I have so much uh, detail from the 1977 event. Um, so, and some of the other stuff is, is a lot more recent. In 2012, I went to have uh, an x-ray of my uh, leg, my right leg. I had, uh, I woke up in the morning uh, and I should explain, I, I retired in January, retired from the state of Vermont in January of 2012. And in October, about nine months later, uh, we're living in Dallas, Texas, where our kids are. And I got up one morning and I couldn't bear weight on my right leg. And I told my wife, you got to take me to the ER. And I, I get all my medical care from the VA. Um, so she took me to the VA hospital in, in Dallas and I waited my turn and they, they x-rayed my leg and the radiologist is like confused. And she ends up taking like four shots of my knee. And she asked me, she said, you know, she said, did you have a shrapnel wound? And I, I laughed. I'm like, no, I never left Missouri. Um, and she said, you know, um, yeah, maybe we could put the x-ray slides up. I think they're number three and four. Um, this flower petal like arrangement in my calf of my leg uh, with a little dot in the middle. Um, the radiologist came down and uh, looked at this in the ER and he showed it to me and I was stunned to see it. I mean, you don't need a medical degree to, to tell that this doesn't really belong where it's at. It's not supposed to be there. It's not part of the human anatomy. Um, and then the second uh, x-ray is from above my knee. And I think that's number four. And number four will be up here in a second. It shows, yeah, there you go. Um, 
That's an enlarged area. I have a square structure about the size of your fingernail with two wires attached to it. And uh, the radiologist said, well, you had to be in an accident. You, you know, you've got a foreign body in your leg. And he was really confused. And he said, well, you know, you're going to have a, there has to be a scar on that leg. And he wanted to see my leg to verify I did have a scar. And I said, no, doc, I, I don't have a scar there. And he says, well, you, you have to, because you can't get something this deep into fascia and tissue and it not leave a scar. Uh, and he said that, you know, that's obviously a, a manufactured structure that doesn't belong in your leg. And I'm like, you know, doc, I don't have a clue. You tell me what this stuff is. And um, he examined my leg and of course I don't have a scar. And that seemed to bother him. And I said, well, doctor, let me ask you, how often is it that you see a foreign object, an anomaly like this under the skin and there not be a corresponding scar over it or by it? And he said, never. He said, I've been a radiologist 23 years. I don't understand how this thing got into your leg. And I said, okay, well, um, when I first saw this x-ray, uh, it wasn't a blow up like this. It was the, the big x-ray. And this is right above my right knee and lateral to the right. And um, I immediately, when I saw it on, on the, on the x-ray, I immediately recognized it um, because I started running uh, in 1980 when I got out of the Air Force because I was leading a pretty sedentary life as a student. And, um, I tried running and I liked it and I ran for the next 40 years, uh, almost. And uh, every time I would run, and I didn't run marathons, I'd run maybe a couple miles a day, but I ran almost every day. Every time I'd hit the two mile mark in my run, there was this spot above my knee and to the right that would go completely numb. And uh, every time without fail, and I took a safety pen one day and at the end of my run, um, and this would fade after about, you know, 20 minutes, it would just fade, go away. But I could, and it was uh, numb and kind of itchy, kind of like a, like a Novocaine shot in your mouth. And I took the safety pen and I could delineate the edges of this thing. And it was about the size of a half dollar. And in the center, I could, I, there, there, there was just no feeling there. But when I saw this x-ray in 2012, it immediately popped into the head, my head that, you know, this thing that I'm looking at on the x-ray is directly underneath where that spot on my leg is that, used, that was numb when I ran. So, you know, I'd, I'd ask a doctor about it in 1982. And she said, well, you know, it sounds, quote, like a histemic reaction, whatever that is. And she says, you know, if it's not interfering with your run, I wouldn't worry about it. So I, I, I didn't until 2012. And then I got worried. <laughs> so anyway, long, long story about that. So um, seeing these things um, had a, a pretty dramatic effect on me uh, because it validated that this all did happen, that it wasn't a nightmare. It wasn't uh, sleep paralysis. Um, it wasn't fantasy or confabulation. This really happened to me. And they put their hands on me. If they have hands, I don't know. Um, and that was really tough for me to process. Because I had kind of put this to bed, uh, other than a nightmare, you know, once or twice a year, maybe. Um, and I can tell you, during my time in the legal community, I don't know if is anybody here uh, an attorney, a paralegal, a uh, legal secretary? Anybody here work in the legal field? Nobody? I used to. I used to manage an attorney office. Okay. Well, you know, what would happen if one of your, uh, one of the, uh, let's say partners, well, partner or one of the associates in the firm uh, came out and said, uh, yeah. I was abducted by aliens when I was in the military 10 years ago or 30 years ago, whatever the case might be. Um, how do you think that would have gone over with, uh, with everyone else in the firm or the managing partners? How do you think that, would have, that news would have gone over? Uh, they would have probably been hospitalized in my case. Also, it was a fairly small town. It wouldn't have gone over well at all. They would have been run out on a rail after that. 
Yeah, I, I, I can tell you for sure, uh, especially when I worked for the government, my, my job, I would have been out of a job. There's, there's no doubt in my mind. And, and I, I, for that reason, I never shared this story with a soul um, because I knew it would have repercussions. But then when I saw the sex ring in 2012 and finally was able to come to terms with it, I, I realized that, you know what, I don't care anymore because they can't do anything to me. You know, they can't fire me. They can't ostracize me. Uh, you know, my peers in the legal community might think I'm crazy. Uh, and a few of them did. And, uh, and I don't care. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the reason I waited so long to be vocal about this, uh, because I never intended to say anything, speak or write about it. Uh, but these x-rays were really the turning point in my life. Um, yep. So anybody have any implants suspect that you might have? It's more common than I thought it was. I have a left ear implant verified on a CAT scan and an MRI both. BB? Um, it's, a, it's behind my left ear. They, they don't call it an implant. They say it's an unidentified metal anomalous metal. Anomaly. <laughs> is, it, is it round like a BB? No, it's a uh, square, like, a, like similar to this. Similar That's to this, but very small. Well, that's interesting because we know that right angles don't happen in the human body. So, <laughs> yeah. I had a lot of people um, email me. Uh, one, one woman emailed me and said that uh, uh, she got up one morning and she'd been having these headaches, um, headaches like she'd never had before. She thought, that, well, maybe I have, uh, you know, migraine headaches, which she'd never had before. And she called me an appointment with her doctor and uh, her doctor um, was going to see her the next day. And that morning she's in the bathroom and um, she sneezed and she blew her nose and she heard a crack in her head in her nasal cavities. And she blew out this thing that looked like a silver BB maybe a little smaller than a, than a, than a BB, but this so, perfect globe like thing was in her Kleenex or in her tissue along with some blood. And she looked at it and said, oh, that's weird. And promptly flushed it down the toilet. And then she thought, oh my God, what'd I just do? I should have kept that thing. And uh, she, she, you know, she didn't, isn't the only person that told me that. I've had other people tell me that too. Um, and people that have things on x-rays that are there for a while and uh, you know, then they go back a few years later and it's not there or like, like Whitley Strieber, Whitley Strieber had a um, little round, like a BB thing in his earlobe. And uh, when he went to have it removed, the surgeon had to chase it because it moved of its own volition and would hide under tissues and, and, um, and I don't remember, I think he got it out of his ear. Anyway, yeah, th these, these kind of things have been recovered from people. There was a, he was a podiatrist. His name was Roger Lear. Uh, he was in California and he, uh, he got interested in people that, that think they have trans, you know, implants. And he documented all kinds of stuff and took, crazy things out of people that uh, that couldn't that they came back the analysis was that you know it's not earthly uh, material or it's weird uh, you know combinations of stuff and uh, he got in he got in trouble he was a podiatrist so that means that he you know he could operate on anything from the ankle or below uh, but there's a famous scene that was in one of those shows in the 1990s, like sightings or uh, unsolved mysteries or something, where it's in its famous footage of him on, on air uh, operating on this guy's arm. Well, this guy had this anomalous object uh, underneath his skin on his arm, you know, no scar to indicate how it got there. And uh, on camera, he removed this, uh, it looked like a piece of rounded glass, frosted kind of. And um, the 
the uh, uh, Board of Medical Practice took away his license. They, they, they took his podiatry license away for operating out of his territory. And uh, he ended up going to South America. Uh, he, he passed away in 2014. So I never had the opportunity to talk with him. Uh, I would like to have, um, but uh, you know, it never, it never, uh, that never materialized. Hey, let me ask you, has anybody here had, um, has anyone here ever seen a UFO? Come on, oh. you guys, <laughs> speak up. I know you guys have. Okay, I'll just assume you haven't. Terry, thank you for sharing your fascinating story. Do you still have the implants in you or did you have them removed? Uh, well, that's kind of a long and complex story uh, and I'll explain uh, kind of briefly, but give you the abbreviated uh, uh, answer. Is anyone in here uh, 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 a physician or, a, or pardon me, a registered nurse or work in a medical profession or radiology? Anybody into medical, into the medical stuff? This is Stacy. I was an RN for many years. Okay. So when I talk about standard of care, you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. So what I did was I, I had had, in 2014, I went and was going to have these things removed. Uh, and I wanted, when, when 2013 is when I started the process. I wanted to have them removed from my body, especially the structure above my knee. That's the one that I was really interested in. Uh, the ones below my knee, they told me, are consistent with bone tissue. They think that that's all made out of bone tissue. And uh, I could find no surgeon that wanted to take them out because they are bone tissue. Uh, yeah, those. Uh, the thing above my knee, I showed to some surgeons and they were like, cool, yeah, I'd love to take this out. And I told them that I wanted it taken out under a forensic protocol where it passed from their hands to mine. Uh, each person signing off on it because I didn't want somebody to come back and say, well, you swapped it out there. You know, what they got out of you was a nail and you put something else in. Uh, I wanted to try to make sure that couldn't happen. So uh, the surgeon told me, he says, yeah, just go to your cardiologist and get a clearance letter because I have this cardiac history. So I went to see my cardiologist and she's like, well, you know, this is a risk versus benefit analysis. This thing you think has been in your legs since uh, 1977 or so, and uh, you want it taken out, and but it hasn't caused you any problems, uh, which truthfully it, it hadn't. I didn't know it was there. Uh, and she said, well, you know, the risk of infection and the risk of anesthesia and the whole process outweighs the benefit that you get from having it removed. Um, and she said, that's the standard of care in this country. And it must be because I went to five cardiologists and got the same answer every time. Uh, so does that make sense to you? When she told me risk versus benefit analysis, does that make sense in determining what the standard of care is? Yes, it sounds typical. Yeah. I, I was very disappointed. And, uh, I had made plans to go to, um, uh, oh, just south of San Diego. What is it? I had made plans to go to Mexico, I'll say that. And uh, I talked to a Mexican physician and I sent him the x-rays and I said, this isn't very deep in my leg. Uh, you know, I am concerned about infection and, uh, you know, I want to make sure that that's covered and, uh, you know, that, you know, you're a qualified surgeon. You don't have any restrictions against your license. He said, yeah, 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 yeah. And um, so for 2,500 bucks, he was gonna remove this thing from my leg. I thought, gee, what a bargain. So I made arrangements to go down there in December of 2017 and had the thing removed. And uh, I woke up in November of 2017. And I had deep puncture wounds on the top of both of my legs, even my left leg, I didn't. And I had never had my left leg x-rayed, so I don't know if I had stuff in my left leg or not. But I had these weird wounds. I had deep puncture wounds to the top of each leg. 
And I think those images are on terrylovelace.com too. Um, but I had this deep hole that I could spread apart and look into, and but it didn't bleed at all. And then I had this weird blue bruising come around the sides of it. And uh, it hurt. And uh, I, but I woke up that morning and I told my wife, I think they came and they took this thing out of my leg. So I went and I got an x-ray. Um, and you know, where do you, where do you go if you want an x-ray? I mean, you can't just walk into a freestanding radiology clinic and say, give me an x-ray, please. So I went to a chiropractor and I told him the true story. And um, at first he was you know, ready to kick me out of the building. But uh, when I showed him the x-rays, he's like, tell me about these. And we went back in his office and he shut the door. And I told him the capsule version of the story. And he says, well, you know what I'll do is I'll, I'll I don't have radio, I don't have x-ray machines here. I, I, we use a clinic down the, down the street, a uh, freestanding clinic that'll do the x-rays for you. He said, take this. He said, I'll write you a script for the x-ray. I'll pay for your x-ray. Um, Cause I told him I was writing the book and he says, promise me you won't use my name or the name of my clinic. Well, I respected that. So he went down and, and I had the x-ray and I got to my car and I pulled it out of the big envelope and I'm holding it up against the window of the car and it's Texas, so of course it, it's bright. And I'm looking at this thing and sure enough, the square structure isn't there anymore. And I felt kind of like good and then I felt like kind of bad. Uh, yeah, I want it out of my body, but I, I, wanted it, I wanted it in my hand. I wanted it to be studied. And um, so I'm both happy and, and sad at the same time. So I dropped the x-rays off at his office and he called me back uh, the next evening and said, did you get a chance to look at your x-rays? And I said, yeah. I said, I, looks like they came and they got the thing. And he says, well, did you see they left you something? And I said, no. And he said, yeah. He says, uh, um, there's a little wire about a centimeter long. And he says, if you look at the x-ray, it's actually two parallel wires together um, and they're right they're parallel with your femur and right next to your femur you know maybe an inch away or, or less um, and I said and that puzzled me and I said well you know what well, let me ask you doc because uh, I think this guy was an experiencer either that or he he'd seen these things in people before because he, he was not not surprised about this and I said, well, doc, let me ask you, you know, when they took this thing out, how could these things, if they're so, so far above us, uh, so advanced, how could they be so inept as to leave two little wires in my leg? And he said, you don't get it. They don't do anything by accident. He said, I think what they did is they gave you an upgrade. And he said, I think they took their 1977 model out and now, you're, now you have the 2017 model in your leg. And he kind of laughs and he says, yeah, he says, you know, those, and those wires are still in my leg. They're, they're still there. And uh, so I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I never had the opportunity to get them removed and analyzed the way I would have liked to have had. Um, but that's, that's the way it went down. So how, how, how much time do we have, uh, Dr. Kim, if I could ask? Um, well, technically, legally, as you would say, uh, we're supposed to go to around 10 o'clock, but you have as long as you want. Oh, okay, great. Good, good. I just make sure I'm not running out of time. No, it's wonderful. Good, good. So, well, before I get into these commonality stuff, anybody else have any uh, questions? Uh, Holly has a question. Um, Good story, Mr. Lovelace. How do you know they harmed you when you were abducted? How did I know they harmed me? I knew when my friends said, don't you remember, Terry, they took us and they hurt us. Um, and I can tell you what that experience was like. Uh, I mean, I knew they, I knew they hurt us because um, I had probably the worst sunburn I'd ever had in my life. Uh, it, it never blistered and it never peeled. Uh, but when I first opened my eyes uh, that morning, I was in a lot of pain and I, we were both admitted to the hospital, uh, the same one that we worked at. And we were admitted with acute dehydration, 
sunburn. Um, oh, and flash burns to our eyes. I had uh, what the doctors called a flash burn. And I guess it's like a, a sunburn to the cornea of your eye. And it's very painful. It feels like you have sand in your eyes. So there was no question. I mean, I knew coming out of this, I knew that we'd been hurt. Um, how we got hurt, what the mechanism was, what the reason was, I don't know. Uh, except I don't feel that it was really intentional. I, I came away from this thing with a lot of uh, anger and resentment toward them. Um, but that's really metal, mellowed over the years because I, I really think it was collateral damage. I don't think that their intention was to torture us. Uh, so I don't know. But yeah, I, that, that's how we knew that uh, we'd been harmed we, because we were in pain. <laughs> Uh, Nancy says, I'm wondering how you feel about the government's supposed disclosure of the existence of extraterrestrial life. You know, um, I took that and I picked that apart. I read it nine times. I made a list about the number of times that they used the word threat. And I think it was something like nine. I, I forget, something around nine times. And I found that interesting. And you know, the word threat. Um, is a little different when military people use it than it is when civilians like you and I use the word threat. You know, we use, we think a threat is imminent danger. And uh, in the military, threat means threat to national security. So um, when they use the word threat, I think it's significant. The uh, ATIP program, Advanced Aerial Threat um, Interpretation Program, uh, run by Lou Elizondo. That's Lou in number six. Uh, that's Lou Elizondo. Um, he came out and spent two days with me. Uh, I was moving. I had sold my house. We were in my living room packing. And uh, he, uh, it's kind of a weird story. Um, in April of 2018, I published my book on... Um, March 10th, I believe, of 2018. And sometime in mid-April, my phone rang and I picked it up and uh, I saw uh, Los Angeles. And I thought, okay, because I, I have a couple of friends in LA and, I, and I, I said, hi, this is Terry. And the voice on the other end said, hi, Terry, it's Tom DeLong. And I didn't have a clue who he was. I really didn't, I, I, I didn't know who he was. And I said, well, hi, Tom, how are you? Uh, and he says, I'm fine, I'm fine. I'm here with uh, General McCardle, Lou Elizondo and Chris Mellon. And we wanna to talk to you about your experience. And I'm like, sure, you know, what do you wanna know? And he said, well, you know, what we'd like to do is Lou would like to come out and talk to you. And um, someone else whose name I've been asked not to mention and I won't because they were very kind to me, but uh, uh, two people from the TTSA organization uh, flew to Dallas to talk to me, and uh, I can tell you they took my they took my uh, experiences uh, very seriously. I had uh, it was really strange in April of 2018. Um, I mean, within a week after I talked to Tom and these guys on the phone, uh, I kept hearing helicopters over my house. And I know this sounds cliche too, but uh, you know, my wife is kidding. She's like, you know, what they do, reroute the traffic copter over our house. And I, I kind of blew it off and I'm like, uh, you know, I don't know. So I'm out gardening a couple days later and um, here comes this big uh, green helicopter and it makes a perfect circle over my house and it's low. And the way my house was situated uh, when you walked out my front door, my front yard, there was a large tree that kind of obscured most of the sky uh, on, that, on the left side and to the right, to my right. Um, in the morning, uh, when, the, when the helicopters came, they usually came between 8 and 11 a.m. And at that time of day, um, there was the sunrise on my, to the right. 
So my field of view was really limited to 180 degrees in back of my house. I could see behind me. And so I could hear these helicopters and they would come in, you know, a distinctive sound of a helicopter. And then they'd pop out of the sun or they'd pop out from around the tree and they'd come, you know, maybe four or 500 feet off the ground uh, and just uh, come over and fly around the house. So I took some, I took some photographs uh, of the helicopters. There's, more, there's just one that I included. I've got like 160 photographs of helicopters, but they're kind of boring. If you've seen one, you've seen them all. This was interesting. I blew this up, number 10. I blew up these, see the objects in the small boxes? I, uh, I started blowing up the, the photographs that I was making of these helicopters because I was out there with my cell phone and I was waiting for them to come over. Every time I'd hear the hel helicopter, I would take a picture of it because I, uh, I'm annoyed. I mean, it, what was kind of funny at first um, really started to wear on us. And I, uh, I went and I looked up some law and I, I found that the FAA, Federal Regulation, uh, CFR, Codified Federal Regulation states that the FAA is responsible for licensing helicopters and light aircraft and well, big aircraft too. But for helicopters uh, in specific, it says um, that the helicopter must display an alphabetical uh, symbol N as in Nancy. Um, and it has to be so tall and, and depending on the size of the helicopter, followed by a numerical sequence identifying that particular vehicle. Uh, and the N uh, denotes that it's uh, registered in the United States. It's the United States helicopter, whether it's commercial or whatever. Uh, and then down at the bottom, there are exceptions to that requirement and they are military and um, which I knew the green ones were military because they were obviously military, but like this one, this was a, yeah, that's a, a Robert, uh, Robinson R-44, uh, and that's a strictly commercial helicopter. Um, but the commercial ones have no markings on them at all. So I, I got a big monitor and I start blowing these images up so I can look for uh, some kind of, of lettering, some kind of markings to tell me who, who they belong to. And when I started doing that, then I started noticing disc in the sky and balls of light and streaks of light. And I've got some uh, like number 11, no, 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 I'm sorry. Number 10. Um, yeah, that's not a very good picture. Um, it's kind of blown up, but I don't know what the heck this is, but it was early in the morning and it was, um, I was out for a walk and it was near city park and um, sky was deep blue. And these lights were all kind of like, uh, they weren't flashing at all, but they were, uh, they were all moving around. Um, just a very strange image. Um, and I've got some more like this that are just, just odd, crescent shaped uh, uh, figures of light. Uh, and uh, yeah, the one below that, no, that's not. Oh, I, I didn't. I didn't send that. I guess. Anyway, that's that's a couple examples. Um, yeah, it's all right. It's the same thing we got up there. Uh, a couple examples. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, if you blow if you blow that up a little bit, you'll see that that's a perfect disc. Uh, silver on top, black on the bottom. I uh, was coming home from the doctor's office one day, and I uh, I live about ten miles from a doctor's office. Uh, and I noticed when I came outside that there was this thing darting around in the sky. And I watch it and it goes out of my field of view and I get back in the car and I get, or pardon me, I get in the car and I start headed to my home. And uh, as I'm driving, I can on occasion see this thing dart across the sky. And then I stop for gas and I could see it circling around the, uh, the, uh, uh, gas station. And I've got about five pictures of it um, other than this, but they were in motion. 
So they, they were when I took the pictures of the thing was moving. So they're not real clear. They're just like this black smudge. When I got to my house and I pulled in my driveway, this thing was at a dead stop um, about maybe five, 500 feet over my house. Um, and it's at a dead stop. Uh, and I took a picture of it. And as soon as I, as soon as I took a picture with my phone, it darts, it shoots off and it's gone. So um, even before I had my phone in my pocket over the years, um, I've seen lots of stuff in the sky. And, and, and it's, it's strange because, you know, I know a lot of people that spend an entire lifetime and they never, they never see a thing in the sky. And I see them all the time. So I wouldn't say all the time, but a few times a year. You know, I had an incident uh, in 2015. Uh, my, I was at the uh, optometrist office. My wife had an appointment at the optometrist office. And, uh, but she didn't have her eyes dilated. There was nothing wrong with her vision. She, was, you know, she didn't need to be wearing glasses for distant vision. And we come out and we're headed for the parking lot. And I see this woman uh, by her car and she's got her head back and she's looking at something. And I look up and here's this silver cigar shaped thing. Uh, I don't know, maybe a thousand feet over us. And I think it was, it was either, it was either closer to us or it was big. Um, but it was, it was easy to see. And I told my wife, I said, look, do you see that? And she's like, see what? I said, right there. Can you see that? And she's like, I don't see anything. She couldn't see it. And I asked this woman in the parking lot, I said, madam, are you looking at what I'm looking at? And she turns around and her eyes are big and she just goes. So I saw it, she saw it, my wife couldn't see it. So I don't know. I mean, is there, there, there has to be some reason. I don't know what ET's, uh, what's running through ET's mind, but there has to be a reason why some people see this stuff and some people just don't see it at all. So I don't know. I mean, I could make guesses about it, but that's all they'd be is guesses. Uh, well, image number five, I wanted to talk about real quick before I move on to commonalities. Uh, that's me looking kind of psychotic. And uh, to my right, the, the woman is, um, Leslie Kane, uh, she pronounces it Kane, but it's actually spelled Keen, K-E-A-N. She's the New York Times reporter that um, that made the uh, TikTok disclosure from the Nimitz Carrier Group. Everybody remember that? Uh, December 17, 2017, uh, story in the New York Times. Should have been the story of the year. And, you know, everybody was kind of like, yeah, you know. Well, not a big reaction. Uh, the guy to the right, uh, my left, is Jeffrey Kripal. And Jeff runs the humanities, he's the head of the humanities department at um, Rice University in Houston. And Jeff had invited uh, Leslie there to speak about UFOs and invited me down to speak about uh, alien abduction. And it was weird, it wasn't a, a UFO conference. Uh, it was, uh, we addressed members of the faculty of Rice and PhD candidates only. Um, no cameras allowed, no press allowed, no public allowed. Um, so it was kind of, it was just kind of a, it was kind of a cool thing to be able to address these academics um, because academia has not been real open. Any teachers? Come on, somebody's gotta be a teacher. Academia is not been real open about, or not real accepting about the UFO uh, phenomenon, or especially about uh, alien abduction. Um, so I was I was glad to see that uh, I was a little worried about the human. Uh, pardon me, the well the humanities department under the humanities department they have the College of Theology. I was a little uh, I won't say worried, but concerned about how their reaction might be. Um, but I'm happy to say everybody was very interested and, um, you know, very uh, 
responsive, very respectful. Um, and afterward, a few people came up to me and said, you know, when I was 16, I saw this thing in the sky. You know, uh, people came up to me and told me their stories. Uh, Jeffrey Kripal here has uh, co-authored six books with Whitley Strieber. Um, and uh, the Rice University is in possession of uh, Whitley's uh, correspondence. You know, I, I feel like I'm doing good that I've got about 1,700 emails from people. Well, when he wrote, when uh, Whitley Strieber wrote the book Communion, he, uh, he received over 2,000 pieces of uh, letters of real mail by the US Postal Service. Um, and they would bring mail by the, you know, by the bag full every day uh, to his house. And he and Ann would go through them all. And all of those, all of those letters um, that Whitley and his wife Ann, uh, that they went through, um, are now in the possession of Rice University and they're making a special wing where you can go in, see the letters, you know, they're, they've all been indexed, you know, you can look, do a search and pull them up. Um, and so they're all uh, cataloged and uh, photographed and uh, should be available online soon. So that was my adventure at Rice University. So from here, um, oh, give me a moment because I, I, I had something that I thought was important. Um, it'll come to me, it'll come to me. Let's do this, let's get into some of these commonalities because uh, there are about 60 and uh, you know what, if, if, if any of these that I read, if these uh, ring a bell to you, and you feel like it, uh, tell me so. If you have anything you want to share, please do. Uh, or if you just want to make a note in chat and say, oh, yeah, I get that, or that resonates with me. So, yeah, let me go, let me go through some of these. Uh, I already talked about having the dream from uh, ages four to six. Uh, that, that was one that just really blew me away because I have a dream that I remember from about age six. It's just nonsensical stuff, but it's it's weird because it's so clear in my mind's eye and it's been a long time. So uh, start off here, have had unexplainable missing or lost time of one hour or more. Oh, wait a minute, you know what? Before I, I'm sorry, before I do this, I'd like to talk about these four cases that I wanted to share with you real quick. And see that Lisa has had missing time. Um, these are four cases that I chose um, because they, they, they all have to do with, with uh, more common commonalities, okay? Uh, the first one is from uh, a story called The Christmas Store. Uh, it was a 76-year-old woman from Henderson, Nevada, who emailed me and wanted to share what happened to her and her husband in March of 1968. And uh, she, she wrote very well and, um, you know, had a very believable story. Her story is this, she and her husband in 1968 were newly married. They were living in Las Vegas, Nevada. And uh, her husband was a nephrologist at a Las, uh, Las Vegas hospital. And once a month, uh, you know how doctors work 60 hours a week. Well, once a month, uh, he'd get a four day weekend to compensate for, you know, so much call and the like. So on this four day weekend, um, this woman, she asked me to call her Olivia. Uh, Olivia said that they had uh, relatives in Reno, Nevada and friends. And Reno is about 240 miles, she told me, uh, from Las Vegas. And they'd make that drive uh, once a month, go up and spend the weekend with their friends, you know, have a good time, turn around and come back, and, you know, and then go back to work. So she's never worked outside the home. She worked in charities and stuff. She's got a degree in uh, 
in fine arts. Um, and in 1968, uh, in March, they're gonna go for their monthly four day weekend. And uh, he got tied up at the hospital. He's normally out of the hospital, she said by three o'clock PM so they can make the drive or at least get started in the daylight and dodge the uh, rush hour traffic. And uh, he got stuck at the hospital till 6 p.m. So they got a late start. They thought about canceling and they, and they didn't. So they made the drive and um, she said that they always stop at the little town of Tunipa, which is still there. And at the time, back in 1968, there was a little like truck stop with a diner called the Stagecoach. And I did some investigating and the stagecoach is still there, except now it's called the station. So it's been there since the, the place has been there since the forties. And uh, they stopped that evening and it was later than what they used when they usually stop and they had dinner and uh, everything was routine and fine. They didn't have anything to drink, nothing alcohol. They, they waited until they get to the, to the, uh, hotel in Reno and they would have a cocktail usually, but they hadn't drink, they hadn't had anything to drink. Um, I asked, was there anything wrong with your vision? You know, were you taking any medication? You know, were the windows in the car clean? You know, easy to look out? And yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so they, they left and they headed towards Reno and they're about 10 miles out of town and they saw this glow on the horizon and uh, they're debating what that could be. And they get over this hill and here's this uh, store, like a little store, uh, you know, like about the size of a McDonald's, she said, however big that might be. And she said it was called the Christmas store. And this was 1968. And she said, you know, I'd never seen a store devoted solely to the holiday. So that was something new. And she says, much less in March. Um, so she thought it was odd. And she said the place was insanely lit up. Uh, it said the Christmas store in green neon lights on top of the building. It was a single story structure with a porch that went across the front of it. And she said that the thing was wound. There were like a dozens of Christmas tree lights wrapped all around the building. And she said there were, there were different colors and some were blinking and some were static and some were twinkling and uh, um, the place was just lit up. And she says, uh, oh, Paul, pull over, I, I wanna see this. And they pulled onto the shoulder of the road directly, directly in front of this thing. And it set back from the roadway a couple hundred feet. Um, and she says that when, when Paul stopped the car, that they quote, zoned out for a minute or two. And I asked her, can you tell me, describe what zoned out means? And she said, well, um, I don't know, just we felt funny. And I said, well, do you think you could have experienced lost time? And she had, you know, she said, response with how would one know? Well, you know, that's a good response. Uh, but she didn't know, but she said it was just a weird, uh, seemed like just for her a couple seconds. So who knows? Um, and she tells her husband, you know, pull in. I want to see if they're open. And he says, pull in where? There's no, there's no, um, there's no driveway. And they look closer and there's no parking lot. It's just sand and sagebrush in front of this place. And uh, her husband is like, well, this is, um, you know, this is, uh, you know, just a waste of our time. I'm going to get back on the road. Um, so he pulls back on the road and uh, she said that this was odd, that they normally would um, use this time to catch up because like I say, he worked a lot of hours and they were newly married and this was normally time for them to have conversation and uh, they didn't have any. And she said she fell asleep shortly after they, they got back on the highway. And she said, that's very unusual. She says, first and only time she can ever remember falling asleep in a car like that. Uh, and she had just attributed it to a heavy meal, uh, but she slept all the way into Reno. 
And when they got to Reno, they checked in, uh, took her stuff to their room, and she said that they went right to bed, uh, which was kind of unusual for them too. Uh, and she said they slept late, they got up, and they felt out of, quote, out of sorts for the whole day. Um, but the following day, they felt back to their, back to their old selves, and they didn't discuss this Christmas store thing. It just, it just didn't come up. And when they got ready to go home, she brought it up and she says, you know, that Christmas store has been on my mind. And he says, yeah, yeah, me too, kind of. And she says, well, let's, on the way back, let's stop, you know, because it'll be daylight. Let's stop and look at this place. And uh, it's like, sure. So th what they did do, they, they did compare notes about, did you see what I saw, what it looked like? And they agreed that the um, neon light on top, um, you know, the kind of script it was, uh, that it was green, that there were Christmas lights wrapped around, that there was a front porch. Their descriptions of the thing jived, except she remembered it being a brick structure. And he thought it was wooden, like made out of like rustic barn wood. So there was a, uh, a difference there. So, um, well, they come back and, and, you know, I'd ask everyone to raise their hand, but you know what happens, right? There is no Christmas store. There's nothing there. And they go up and down the highway three times. It's, and they're doing this in the daylight. They know where they saw this. They're familiar with the territory. There was no Christmas store. So. Hey, it's me again. Thank you for watching uh, this interview and this podcast. I will be doing tons more material. So please uh, let me know how you're liking the podcast. Write me with any questions. Write me with any topics or subjects or people that you want me to look at or situations you want me to look at. And I will do that in the future or anyone that you want me to interview. Um, I'll be developing this. This is just the beginning. So stick with me as we kind of get it organized and get it started. But like and subscribe. And I appreciate you guys watching. Check out my website, secrettoeverything.com. Be well, be safe, and see you next time.